questions, please feel free to ask, or if you want to at the end, you can ask at the end. Um, so this is a list of my uh, uh, equipment. Sam, press OK. Okay. Um, now, I'm not spending a lot of detail, time looking at it and talking about it, but if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask as well. So there's three main elements of um, astrotropic equipment you need. First, it's obviously a mount of some sort. Uh, I have one here, it's the Skywatcher e EQ5. Um, this is a, a tracking mount and also it's an e uh, equatorial mount. Um, and it's probably the most important element of the whole equipment. Uh, it's, it's the base of everything. And there's two things I said there. One is a tracking mount. And the fact that it, it's a tracking mount because it actually has the motors inside and two axis rotation, one here and one here. And they track the object in the night sky for you. The second thing is that's an equatorial mount. And what that basically means is it's assigned, uh, aligned with the axis rotation of the Earth, as you can see here. So it basically points, in our case, to the North Celestial Pole. Not exactly Polaris, as most people know. It's the North Celestial Pole. And the reason that that's important for doing deep sky imaging is that it actually keeps the object in the same orientation when you're, when you're imaging over the line. Particularly if you're doing deep sky, you're taking long exposures. I take 10 minutes of exposures at a time and for hours upon hours at end. Um, so it's important that the object stays in the same frame. Okay, so, and hopefully this will demonstrate that there's a very simple animation. Um, and if you look at the red box and just keep an eye on the red box, what do you see Orion doing? If, you, if that was your frame. You can see Orion going over, up and down like this, right? <clears throat> and it's what's called field rotation. So it actually rotates in the image, where the, the, the yellow box here is actually an equatorial uh, mount, and it keeps the, the object exactly in the same frame. So that's a very two very important things. That's this a tracking mount, so it tracks the, ob the object in the sky for you, and also keeps it upright in the, in the same orientation, OK? So the next important element is the, the scope itself. And this is an FRA um, an astrograph. It's, it's 400 millimeter focal length. And what that means is basically is we're from this point where the light comes in to where the focus point is here. So that's the focal length of the telescope, as many people know. The aperture is 71 millimeters. This is the diameter here. And if you divide one over the other, you get what's called the F ratio. So first is the focal length. The focal length, the longer the focal length, the smaller the field of view, and the opposite is true. Um, so uh, the bigger the scope that you normally see, if it's a longer focal length, it will be very, very smaller and smaller in, uh, object than, that you're imaging in the night sky. This one here images um, approximately uh, five-ish full moon widths, which is half degree in times five, two and a half degrees or so. Um, so if you divide, divide one, of the other, one by the other, as I said, you get your F ratio of 5.6. So that gives you an indication of how fast the scope is in capturing the data in the sky. So the higher the F ratio, the slower the scope is, and the less light it's going to let in over um, for imaging, and the, the lower the number, the faster. So actually in this scope, I also have what's called a focal reducer, and that decreases the focal ratio from 400 uh, millimeter to 290, and, and hence also brings down the F ratio to 3.9. It's faster and it's wider. You're probably wondering, that's a very small scope for imaging. People are always amazed how small the scope is. Um, so a lot of this nebulas you see around the room, these are absolutely massive in the night sky. They're huge. Like this one over here is like about 10 widths of the full moon. So it's, it's an incredibly large area of, of the night sky. So the next element <coughs> is this red thing here, this is the camera. This is a ZW2600MM camera. Sorry, Marty, can I just say for people online, we're taking a video of Marty's <laughs> telescope as he's going through it. And when we put his talk up online, we'll have a picture in picture of, okay. of the bits. So Thank, thanks, so, Marty. <laughs> so this, um, there's two things about this. This is a dedicated astro camera, and it also is a mono camera. It's not an, a color camera at all, okay? so. There's two elements there. The first, as I said, it's an astro camera and, and it's cooled. There's actually a fan inside here. And the reason uh, 
I chose this is basically it's designed for low light, um, very, very sensitive camera, and it's cooled, meaning that it actually cools the sensor down to, you can actually bring it down to minus 20 degrees C if you wish. And what that does, when you're imaging that, particularly if I'm imaging something over a long period of time, the sensor will heat up. It actually adds noise into the image itself. To reduce that, you have this cooling on the sensor. The second thing I said there, uh, so it actually helps with calibration frames. I'm not going to explain how that's done, but that's what it does. It helps for too. It also is a mono camera. And I've just shown two, uh, ignore the one on the, on the far right here, but two <laughs> ones here. This is a standard color camera that you have a DLSR or a color camera, which is a NAS camera. And the one in the middle is actually the same integration time for a, a mono camera. And you can see the quality of the image is much, much better. And the reason for that is this, and this is what's called a bare matrix. On a color camera, in order to, to create the color image itself, it has, actually has a pattern on the, the sensor platter with two green, one red and one blue, small, tiny, tiny, tiny filters, right? Which, you know, capture the blue, the green, or the red channel. Okay, so you can imagine if you had a mono camera instead, um, I'm capturing the whole entire sensor pattern, not just the red or the blue, the green channels. But obviously there's a, there's a playoff on that. You need what's called a filter. A filter I have actually a filter wheel here. And in that filter wheel, I actually have seven filters. It's more complicated, but it's, it's much more sensitive. And you can see from the images I showed shortly ago, the difference you can get from the image quality. Okay. So that a red, green, and blue filter. So this, if you imagine this is your, your uh, visible light uh, if the wavelengths, it, the red captures the red, but it captures the entire frame of all the sensor pixels are pixels of red or green or blue, okay? Um, obviously you have to capture different exposures, but also in here I have a luminous filter, which captures the whole broad section of the, the, the uh, wavelength of light uh, for a visible light, sorry but also has these very, very special uh, mission band filters, sometimes called line filters. And they capture the, the emission from particular nebula. Most of the nebula in the night sky, which are called emission nebula, which I normally image, um, emit at particular frequencies of light, very strongly. These are large, massive you know, agglomerations of gas in the night sky, and they're illuminated because of the stars or something in the region which is ionizing the gas generating uh, emission in particular bands. So the first one is, uh, I think this has uh, got a laser pointer. Maybe not. He does. Um, oh yeah, see it now. Yeah. Um, so next, oh there, you can't really see it, but first is um, hydrogen, second is oxygen, and the third down here is sulfur. And these are the three main filters that I use in here. And I combine them, so assigning them to particular channels, like red for hydrogen or oxygen or, or sulfur, whatever way you want to do it. Generally, um, you can combine them in any way you want, so you can assign them to any uh, uh, of the red, green, or blue channels. But the most common one is what's called the Hubble palette. This particular combination is a full scale image generated from the sulfur assigned to red, the uh, hydrogen alpha to the green, and the uh, oxygen to blue. Create this lovely image. So this is what I have in here. And they actually are essential for me because I I image from my uh, from my house in, in Glasnevin, in the centre of Dublin. So without these, I would be completely useless because the amount of light pollution we have, uh, you wouldn't be able to pick up anything at all, to be honest. And they cut through light pollution; you don't even see it practically. Right? Nothing beats a, a dark sky, of course. Okay, so that's the equipment. Okay. Um. So actually, before I just move on slightly, before I do that, just a few other things I've got. An autofocuser on it here, which does autofocusing for me. Saves a lot of hassle, I have to say. And down here also, I have what's called a guide camera. And this is essential for doing deep sky. And um, it basically, the light comes in, there's a small prism inside, knocks out the light to the side. And this camera here um, uh, allows me, it corrects for uh, imperfections and say I didn't do the polar alignment correctly, or there's a periodic errors in your, in your mind. And the final item is this small red box at the top, which is the brains of the operation. And that basically controls everything. Okay, so that's the equipment I have. There's other bits and pieces on it, but 
if you want to ask me later about exactly what the, the details are, please do. Okay, so that just gives me an idea what I use to do the capturing with. So I'm now going to show you uh, the main part of the talk. And this is um, the actual, hopefully you can see that from the back end, but that's the Milky Way band here. Okay, you can just about see it. And um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you on a journey across the Milky Way, looking at and stopping at not all of these. Um, these are actually at uh, two scale, approximately. All right, it's the best I could do, two scale. So looking over here um, in the Orion Nebula, there's the Doriga, down to Cepheus, and down to Cygnus. Okay. So the first one we're going to look at is the Rosette Nebula up here uh, on the top left. So this is an image I took last year, start of last year. Um, it's probably everybody probably knows this particular nebula. It's a very famous one. Um, extremely bright, and in the in the telescope visually, I, I'm not sure if anybody's seen this, but it is actually quite nice to see. You can actually just make it out. It's a clear night, there's no moon. It's actually you can see the outer shell here, just of the nebula itself. But this was shot uh, last year, as I said. It's shot only in hydrogen and only in oxygen. Okay, there's no other. Um, and I've, I've done a bit of color mixing to, to create the, the image itself. The nebula itself uh, gets its name, as you can probably imagine, it looks a bit like a rose, hence the name Rosette, all right? Um, it's about 5,000 light years away, so it's quite distant. Um, it's about 130 light years across, and it's, it's a, in, in the constellation Monoceros. Um, it's probably one of the, the largest and most luminous um, star forming regions we actually have in the Milky Way. And there's thousands of stars being formed on here. And I'll show you what, what can, uh, why that is shortly. It, the, the shape of the nebula itself is actually to do with these stars here. And there's a small star cluster, NGC 2244, in the center. And it's got some of these ginormous O and B type stars, which are pushing out huge amount of radiation, ultraviolet radiation, stellar winds pushing the gas out, create the bubble, which you see in the center. Okay, so the, the actually in this, this is all hydrogen gas, mainly. There's a bit of sulfur here, but in, in here, this is all oxygen. This is why it's blue, okay? Um, and the gas, as I said, has been pushed out. You can uh, show it a wee bit closer in and hope you can see it. These all, these dust and gas clouds as well, these are cold and uh, basically call it cause the silhouette and also star form regions there's stars forming in these globules that you see around here as well it's also known and explore that in a minute uh, it's also known as the skull nebula so i don't know if anybody can see the skull here but so mm -hmm. this this is the the two eye sockets oh. and the nose i always call it the flaming skull nebula to be honest because it looks more <laughs> like a flaming skull to me um now, obviously, I didn't pick, pick this image, all right? This is not my image here. This is from the Chandra X ray telescope, but it's a cut section through the nebula itself. And any of these red dots are actually newly forming stars. There's thousands of them, thousands of them in this, this region itself. So that's like a combined image of a color image and the X ray telescope itself. So it's quite an impressive looking image. So that's the Rosette Nebula. So I'm now going to move across. To another region to a completely different type of object, right? And this is uh, the if you imagine uh, if we go back a tiny bit, um, it's on the bottom two stars of the Gemini here. Um, can't remember which one it is. Castor Pollux is one of the, the twins. And there's two stars, Teja and Propus here. These are actually a complete pain to actually image because they cause for astrophotographers. We'll always complain about these two stars, particularly this one, because it just creates this massive halo um, uh, effect when you actually image. So look at, ignore this for a second. Um, this is not um, a star form region. It's actually a supernova remnant. So it's actually a dead star. The, the actual um, uh, emission comes from the gas that has been ejected out from the supernova, which you think um, exploded about 30,000 years ago, they think. So it's actually a massive region. It's actually almost as large as the Rosette in terms of size. I think it's about 100 and, um, 140 light years in size. It's enormous. 
it has all these tendrils that look a bit like like a jellyfish tendrils, but actually it's two shells, so one here and one here. So these are two shells itself pushing out from the when the, the star uh, from the star died. Uh, in the center there somewhere, there's a pulsar or neutron star. That's the, the, the remnant of the star, um, what's left of it. Okay, moving on to this object down here. This is actually in the constellation of Orion. And if I didn't tell you the name of it, would you guess what it is? But it's actually called the Monkey Head Nebula. So it looks a bit like a monkey's head. So you can see the eye and the nose and the mouth. Of it. So I don't know, at least imagine their names. I don't know what you got. Well, you can see it, it does look a wee bit like a monkey head. Um, it's it's a, an emission nebula sim, similar to uh, the Rosetta, where it's an active star form region. There's a, lot, there's a small star cluster in the center here somewhere, which is actually causing the bubble effect mm -hmm. in the middle. As you can see, most of these nebulas, which are emission nebulas, caused by star form regions, you get a bubble set in the center, and then this sort of ring of of lighter gas, because it's been pushed quicker and further away, and then uh, denser gas in the center. So that's that's the, the monkey head nebula. <laughs> so this actually is um, the how I made the image, just behind the scenes, if you want to call it. So the, this is an SHO, so hydrogen, oxygen, mm -hmm. and sulfur combined in the SHO. So this is why it gives this sort of yellowy color this is uh, sulfur and hydrogen. <clears throat> and then the blue color, as I said, that's oxygen. So this, you can see, this is the oxygen region. It's quite faint here and here. And then there's quite different between this. This is hydrogen and sulfur. And this was shot just after Christmas. And there's about five, six hours for these. And there's about eight hours of that. Usually you find that oxygen is very, very faint. And you take more uh, data to try and get, the, get that. Okay. So... Now we're, we're moving across slightly further afield to my favorite constellation, Auriga. The, and this, um, hopefully you can see it. I'm sorry for this. I can't don't try um, to get rid of that. I think it's a touch screen, so I think. No. Uh, I'd be afraid. Not yeah. <laughs> no, that's not. Yeah, we leave, 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 leave. Uh, Had enough uh, technical <laughs> issues around. <laughs> so, so this. Uh, is, um, this was shot um, uh, in sort of November, this is October, November time. And it's a four panel mosaic. So this is actually huge. It's actually down at the back of the screen, here, down the back of the room. And this, as you can see, there's two main nebulas, one here and one here. And up here, you can see a star cluster, and there's a couple of other nebulas up here, which one is hidden actually behind there. So if you looked at that, you would imagine that there's two nebulas, which are actually closely interacting, but they're not at all. And um, this nebula and this nebula are at two completely different distances. The one here, um, this is the the Tapples nebula, you can see why in a second. And this one down here is the Flame of Star nebula. And so they're actually 12,000 light years and 1,500 light years. So they're completely different distances. So this is the, the Tapple Nebula. So I'll actually move in slightly. You can see why it's called the Tapples because of these, right? And this again is a, an emission nebula formed from where gas has been ionized from the star formation in the, the nebula itself. And the reason for the shape of the nebula is this star cluster here, which again is pushing the nebula out in either direction and is actually the reason for the shape of these. So these are actually uh, two nebula, two large, I think in the past, were two big, huge pillars of gas and dust, gold gas and dust. And the stars that are here, the star cluster, has, over time has steadily eroded the, the nebula itself, the, the, the pillars themselves, creating the distinctive, uh, nebula, the distinctive shape of the, the tadpoles. So it's quite something when you actually go in and look at it. I've never actually done that. I actually did that when I was doing that. I never actually went in and in and in, you know, to see them. It was quite, quite nice to see. So that's this. We're now going to look at the solar nebula. So this is, oh, sorry, it's um, it's actually there, but it's, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it anyway. Um, 
So this is actually called, uh, that's called the Flaming Star Nebula, and hopefully you can see why it's called the Flaming Star. It's because of this star here, A.E. A -E -E so this, you think, is actually part of the nebula. It's nothing to do with it. Is, well, it is in the nebula at the moment, but it was never formed here. All right. It's actually flying through the nebula at the moment at an enormous speed of 200 kilometers a second. Right. So it's flying through the nebula. But as it's passing the, the, this um, gas and dust region, it's actually causing to, to uh, emit. And it's actually the, the cause of the nebula itself. If you can see around here as well, it's not just an emission nebula, it's actually a reflection nebula, where the dust in the, the nebula itself, the gas here, is reflecting the scattering the light and causing it to glow. So this star is like a really big star, but actually was formed, I think they traced it all the way back to where the trapezium is in Orion, so okay. M42. So it's been traveling through space by in a few million years, it's actually now in this location and it's flying off Again, it be, won't be there, you know, at some distant time in the past, in the future. So, so, uh, so that's the, the flaming star. So we're now going to look at this region. And it has um, two distinctive uh, nebulas, the spider and the fly, it's called. All right. So they're at actually at two different distances, but, you know, one's at 10,000, one's at 7,000 light years away. Um, and to be honest, I can never see the name where the spider comes from, to be honest. I, you really do need a big telescope to, to resolve this, but supposedly in the center of it, there's a, a body, you know, in the center, of, and then these legs of dust and gas going out, forming the, the name where it gets the, the spider name from. This looks a wee bit like a, a, a fly. Like a, it does look a bit like a fly. This, I'm not so sure where the spider comes from. It might be just the, the, the filters that I'm particularly using. Um, so it's you know it's just, it's usually they're frequently imaged like this together, so that's why they're called the spider and fly. Mm -hmm. And then moving down here to my favorite object in the sky is M thirty eight starfish cluster. So this is a, a um, it's also known as M M thirty eight and Charles Mesnier he named it. He didn't discover it, um, and it's an open cluster of stars, you know, dozens of stars. Um, um, that are you know uh, at about four, five thousand light years away, and a in a sort of a shape of you know of the the legs of, of a starfish. It's very very nice. I, I love looking at this particular region of the night sky where you've got the two the star clusters here. There's actually more up in this direction of the, the frame, but you can't see them most of this having them. In. So this, as I said, is a four panel mosaic, and I, and it's only in hydrogen and oxygen. It was amongst them. So this is. The hydrogen frame. You can see that you know the tendrils here, the, the two two uh, nebulas, and this is the option. And you can see it's actually quite bad looking in terms of noise, but I cleaned it up all right. And, and so it's there's about six, 15, 16 hours in that, and there's about twenty hours of data in this one. But that's four panels eight. It's actually five because I did this way as well, just to bring it out a bit. So okay. So moving across further on the night sky to uh, the Heart and Soul Nebula. And this is an absolutely massive region of the night sky. It's like about 10 full moons width, to be honest. Um, and it's two very, very distinctive, very well-known nebulas, very close to the double, you know, Perseus double uh, star cluster. Um, so these are both about 7,000 approximately light years away. And there's about 100 light years across in each of them. They actually are interacting with each other in this region here. They actually are two distinct, uh, but they actually interact in that location. Um, the the soul level, I don't really know where it gets the name soul. I can't really see the soul, you know. But I always this kind. I always call it. A, it looks a bit like a, a fetus, you know. I I think it looks more like a fetus, oh, or, yeah. um, and that's why it's also known as embryo nebula. So. Um, so there's two distinct bubbles in it. There's a very, 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 very dense star form region here as well. So in the center of here and down in the other bubble, there's actually large, very large O type or beast type stars, which are actually form the shape of the nebula. So they're the actual pushing out the gas in either direction as I described previously. And you've also got large you know, pillars. And these are all where other stars are forming around here. So you have this particular, so, 
And you can zoom in a bit closer here. So very nice. I love this this particular section of the navel here. So you can see these pillars, a bit like the pillars of creation, you can mm -hmm. see the eagle navel. So that's the two two bubbles of gas here. So it's very, very, very nice, I have to say, uh, looking at it. I always am constantly amazed that I can capture these type of images, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So the next and the most distinctive one is the heart nebula as well. So, uh, so this nebula, um, again, it's a mission nebula, and it's an active star form region. And it, the, the cause of the nebula is this star cluster here. And it's a very, very, again, very, very, very large stars. The heart of the heart, or Malate 15. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation or not, but that's how you pronounce it. Um, and these, there's large O-type stars in here, which are generating massive amount of radiation, UV radiation, stellar winds, pushing the gas out in either direction, forming this particular distinctive shape. Down here also, so that's a, a much closer, um, you know, zoom in section. Mm -hmm. You can see these pillars. These are all probably where active star forming is happening at the moment. And this other weird looking shape, this, uh, it's, it's called the fishhead nebula. You know, okay. possibly this is the gills and this is the yeah. eye or something. So it does look a wee bit like bats, probably in a different orientation. So again, another emission nebula close by and part of the whole nebula itself. The whole uh, molecular cloud here is it itself. So it's quite distinctive. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention was the planetary nebula here called Weibo 1. So this, if I go back, I don't know if you can see it there, this weird looking blue shape. Oh. So I actually had a bit of a confession to make on this one. So the first time I ever missed this, which was about three years ago, I actually thought it was a stacking artifact. <laughs> I'm not that I'd say. <laughs> but um, I've since learned that it actually is a, a small planet now, but you can see it down here. So this is like a, a dead star, a bit like our own star will end up someday. And that's the outer shell of the envelope of the, the star being pushed out into interstellar space. Um, somewhere in the middle there should be probably a white dwarf. So that's that's the that's how you actually made it. So this one here, there's tons of data. There's over a hundred hours put into this one, um, um, and uh, a lot of data, <laughs> um, a lot of lot of times we are we are and stuff. So these this is the hydrogen, oxygen, uh, sorry, uh, oxygen and sulfur. So there's not a lot of uh, sulfur in this. I know that, but I, I just bought it uh, for the actual color. I was more interested in the the, the blue shape and the, the red, sorry, the red and the, the blue rather than the sulfur. So it's quite interesting. You can see I'm trying to do all sorts of things to put it out because I made a mistake when I was doing the, the, the framing, unfortunately. So, okay. So moving across then to um, Cepheus. On the bottom of Cepheus here, you've got Elfin's Trunk Nebula. That's probably, probably a lot of people have heard of this one. This is about two and a half thousand light years away. And again, and, uh, it's actually quite faint. Um, and you actually images, you can hardly see the nebula at all. Um, the red is all stinking hydrogen. Um, and the center region is different mixture of gas. And it gets its name for this, which is the elephant's trunk. And this, <coughs> this is a gold gas and dust pillar. And there's active star forming region here. There's actually stars inside here forming at the moment. But behind that, you've got large stars which are causing, you know, you know, the nebula to grow from the back. It's actually been silhouetted. So that's actually how it gets the distinctive shape. This pillar it's been pushed on all sides by the the stellar winds from different different uh, different direction of the stars that are in the region itself. So, and then this is the the pillar. So it does look a wee bit like an elephant's trunk if you sort of close your eyes and whatever. <laughs> Um, okay, so so that's down to the Cygnus slip. So I'm sure maybe, maybe a lot of people have, have heard of this particular region of the sky. And this is a dead star, parts of a dead star which are um, which exploded, they think, approximately 25,000 years, 20, 10, 20,000 years ago. And these are distinctive parts of the, the star, the, the outer shell of the star pushing out. The other, sp the other space, forming these beautiful nebulas. These, it's really, really cool to see this. Like when you see it on the, an image, it's, it's shot in hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. So this actually is a massive region of the night sky. 
you know. So it's again, um, it covers about six times the width of the full moon. It's a four panel mosaic, and um, it's probably the first mosaic I actually did. I shot it about two years ago, um, and fell in love with doing mosaics after that. So, um, and it's made up of three particularly uh, distinct regions. The first, and um, it's probably this way to look at this, but this is the, the Bat Nebula or the Eastern Veil here. And all the blue is, 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 is oxygen and all the red is, is actually hydrogen. And this is Pickering's Triangle, it's called. And down here, then, this, this shape here um, is called the Witch's Brew or the, the Western Veil. So it's actually um, it's just a really beautiful nebula. Very hard to see it in, the, in a telescope. I have never seen it in a telescope. I've looked many times. I can't, I can't, but I like me see it. What I wanted to show you actually here, the approximate center of where the star is, they've tried to find this, but they have, you know, they haven't discovered exactly, exactly if it's a pulsar or, or just a star that blew up. And, but they think somewhere in there there's a pulsar uh, or some, some description. Okay, so. And then we come to the final image, um, and this is uh, the central region here of Cygnus de Swan. Okay, so, and you can see this is a four panel mosaic as well. Um, and there's three very distinctive objects in it. Um, I just love this image, to be honest. Um, and uh, this is the uh, Crescent Nebula, and over here is the Tulip Nebula, and down here is WR134. These are very different types of nebulas, completely different. You've seen um, active star form region. You've seen dead star that was left of. These two objects here are not, these are stars dying. So this one is the Crescent Nebula discovered by William Herschel. And um, if you can see, there's a bright region at the top here. So when you actually image this, you only see this real very, very, very distinctive bright shape. And this is where, obviously, when Herschel, when he was, image, when he was looking at that image, and also, um, he could see the crescent, and that's where it got his name, gets his name. I, I don't call it the crescent, I call it the brain, either, because it looks like a brain. Um, it's actually got two distinctive shells, left and right. And this is a, a very unusual type of star. Well, left, well, what's what the stars actually do? It's called a wolf red star, after Charles Wolf and uh, and George Red, two astronomers, it's an absolutely massive star, um, way bigger than our own. And um, it's about five thousand light years distance, and this thing is about 20, 20, 25 light years across. Um, it's a huge, extremely um, luminous star, and it's a and, a, and it's basically what it's doing is pushing off the envelope outer envelope of, of the star out into the interstellar space. And it also has extremely uh, strong stellar winds and the two are interacting, creating this absolutely amazing looking nebula. Um, the, again, the blue distinctive shape is INS oxygen. This is all a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. And there's lots and lots of, you know, dust, dark dust lanes in it as well. Like it's quite amazing that this actually is shot um, the whole frame, oh, sorry, the, of the, the mosaic is shot in hydrogen and oxygen only. All right. But uh, a small cheat on this one. Um, because if you, because it's so bright, and, and, and you'll see why uh, and later, um, in oxygen, when you actually combine in, in hydrogen and oxygen combination, it looks fluorescent green. I mean, I'm no joke, it was looked absolutely horrible. <laughs> So what I did, I went back and I, I took frames of, of sulfur as well and combined an SHO as in sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen, a red, green, blue, and I and I and I blended it in. So just this section, just this particular nebula, it's, it's actually SHO. The rest of the image is HO. So it's a quite an amazing looking thing, to be honest. Um, it's very very unusual. Uh, so that's a star coming towards the end of its life. Essentially. So we're now going to just move across to look at the Tulip Nebula. And uh, this is a very interesting region. I have to say, I, I'm constantly amazed by this, uh, that they can actually capture this. I'll talk in a second. But this is a, the emission nebula. Again, similar to other nebulous emissions where stars are forming. And the, the shape of the nebula is actually come, uh, created from 
the stars that are actually inside the nebula pushing the gas out like this, creating the distinctive shape of petals. And then sort of like a stamen, this is like gold dust or gas from giving your stamen, looking like the tulip. Okay. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is actually this here. And this is, um, you may have heard of Cygnus X1. So this is actually, uh, well, it was discovered in, in the 60s uh, during rocket testing. And um, it's actually a very, very strong source of X-rays. And it's, a, it's, a, it's actually, there's a bright blue star here and beside it is a black hole. So the black hole itself is, a, is about 15 solar, solar masses. And what it's doing, it's, a, it's pulling the gas from the companion star and creating a very large accretion disk. And on doing so, it emits light at very high frequency of X-rays. Not only that, it also creates two relativistic jet jets up in this direction and down in this direction. And in this is actually formed from the bow shock of the, the, the relativistic jet from a, an, a black hole. I just find that's completely mad that I can actually image that. Like it's just crazy that I can actually can image something like this. Like this takes my mind away. Like so, it's actually orbiting about five, six days, and it's pulling the gas in and shooting it off in directions up and down. And and uh, okay, so that's the uh, a dead star again. And then this is um, another interesting nebula here. And this is actually, again, similar to the Crescent Nebula. It's a wolf red star. So it's a star at the end of its life, coming to the end of its life, and it's throwing off the outer shell out into interstellar space, which interacts with the stellar winds and also the, inter the interstellar medium, creating this absolutely beautiful looking nebula. Um, it's called the, the, I call it the Cygnus Ring Nebula, but I don't know. It's, it's like a wheel or, a, or you know, maybe a ring, I suppose. Um, this is slightly unusual in the fact that it's an eclipsing binary and it's an algal eclipsing binary. So if you remember algal, so it's a, a, a companion, so it varies in brightness as the stars come around each other in, orbit, in, in our plane of sight. So that's quite an interesting one. And then another few other interesting objects in is the 34 Cygni, which is actually a a recurring nova, so it's, it's a, a nova. With, sorry, it's a star which is extreme brightness and variation, and uh, it's about six thousand light years away. It's called Revenant of the Swan because it's in prison. Uh, sorry, in the uh, Cygnus <coughs> Swan, but also it's Revenant because it's because it's undead. It comes back to life. <laughs> you know, that's why it's named. Supposedly. And then the final object in here is the soap bubble nebula. So this is a planetary nebula. Uh, of a, a star again like our own will end up something like this pushing out a very faint and wispy nebula of the outer shell of the star as a stayed. And in the center there somewhere is probably a white dwarf. So this is how I made the just to give you an idea of how I made it. So you can see the oxygen that we were saying about how strong it was. That's oxygen, ionized oxygen. It's absolutely blazing and ionized oxygen. It's not so much in hydrogen, to be honest, like, but that's why when you stack it together, it actually turns bright green. So it looks absolutely horrible. Um, there's about 30 to 40 hours in each. And this was shot from maybe May to about September of this year. I know you're going, God, how did you do that? That was a lot, <laughs> a lot of wee small hours after taking as much as I can and any time I could get it. I was in the middle of the night trying to image it. I also shot it um, for the stars here. This is separated from the, the background, but it's shot in R RGB. So I took RGB for the stars as well, just to make it a bit stars. You can see the stars are a lot more colorful. There's a lot more color in them. Normally, I don't do that. I actually create, uh, you know, image the, the combine the hydrogen and oxygen together for the stars. Okay, so that is my talk. <laughs>